the Wall Street bombing of 1920 that killed 40 people and injured several hundred more remains a mystery to this day. The bombing occurred at 12.01 p.m. on Thursday, September 16th, 1920, Manhattan, New York, and the target was the financial district called Wall Street. The lunch rush was just beginning as a nondescript man driving a cart pressed an old horse forward before stopping at the heart of Wall Street, right across from JP Morgan & Co, one of the financial district's busiest corners. The driver got down and quickly disappeared into the crowd. The wagon containing 45 kilograms of dynamite and 230 kilograms of heavy cast iron sash weights exploded into a hail of fragments, immediately killing more than 30 people and injuring some 300. The carnage, according to the FBI, was horrific and the death toll kept rising as the day wore on and more victims succumbed. So this bloke, he's got a couple of horses trotting about day-to-day -day stuff, but he's got 45 kilograms worth of dynamite in there. That's almost one chippo. And almost a, almost a quarter of a ton of heavy metal as well. It's a big old wagon. Obviously, a lot of damage was caused from the explosion to the surrounding buildings and area. In fact, it was, at the time, around $2 million worth of damage. And today, you can still see some of the cracks on the buildings on Wall Street. Wow. So it's lasted over 100 years. And in today's money, $25 million worth of damage. I ain't got that sort of money. Wow, that's a lot, even yeah. for Wall Street. Yeah. Not paying 13 quid. So it is lunchtime in Manhattan, obviously the busiest time. The hustle and bustle of Wall Street is completely alive. Everybody's out. And this explosion, this bomb, this attack was meant to really target the wealthy people of Wall Street. However, there was one small issue with that because it was lunchtime. All the wealthy bankers are inside. They're safe from any harm where they've sent the clerks, you know, the messengers out onto the street. You know, maybe go grab me a coffee. Yeah. The boat that has all the brokers, the stenographers, they're all the, they're all the real victims of this. Yeah. So the men of wealth and power actually did end up escaping any harm from the explosion. And Morgan himself was in Europe. Because trading can be so volatile, especially with events that have political and economic repercussions, the president of the New York Stock Exchange actually suspended trading just a minute after the bomb went off. Oof. One minute, they won't lose any money, you know. No. They, they'll do anything. Shortly after, police and soldiers came in from Governor's Island to help the injured, to guard the scene, and to search for evidence. So obviously people have started to speculate on, you know, what's happened, who could have been behind this explosion. Uh, and at first, the police, you know, the fire brigade, the FBI, they actually didn't believe that it was an act of terrorism. It's quite unusual, isn't it? Yeah. A massive I mean, bomb goes off in the mid middle of the day in Wall Street, and they don't think it was terrorism. 45 kilos of dynamite? No. That? <laughs> Accident. Now, they were actually pursuing leads, of course, interviewing hundreds of people, and people that were also in and around the area of the explosion on the day, but they couldn't actually find anything of value, nothing important, nothing that could help them figure out what's happened. By 3.30 p.m. the next day, the Board of Governors of the New York Stock Exchange had actually met and decided to open business the following day. So people cleaned the streets to prepare for the brokers and traders to come back, but by doing so, they destroyed much of the evidence, which may have helped the police solve the crime. On the following day, there was a rally planned to celebrate Constitution Day, and many people joined, but this time their motivations were different to rally in defiance of the attack. Looking at the rally, the New York Assistant District Attorney argued that the timing, location, and method of delivery all pointed to Wall Street and JP Morgan as the targets of the bomb, suggesting in turn that it was planted by radical opponents of capitalism, such as Bolsheviks, anarchists, communists, or militant socialists. Now this did lead investigators to start looking at groups which opposed the American system and institutions. So, so the Galleonist group, the Soviets, and the US Communist Party were all investigated. So let's have a deeper look at some of the leads and theories of this case. So soon after the bombing, investigators started getting their first leads. A chocolate peddler woke up in hospital and told the police that he had actually seen the driver of the wagon. He described him as a dark complexioned, unshaven, wiry man, probably 35 to 40 years old, and dressed in working clothes and a dark cap. He seemed to be about five foot six inches tall, 
and had dark hair. After the bombing, there were a lot of letters being sent through warning of upcoming explosions. And there was one that stood out in particular, and that is of Customs House, which was said to blow up on Friday at 2 p.m. Now, of course, <laughs> this led to a lot of people turning up to watch. A lot of the letters that were actually warning of the explosion appeared to be coming from one particular individual, and that man's name is Edwin Fisher. Edwin Fisher was actually a tennis champion, and the police called him in to question him, especially given he had sent postcards to friends and family, warning them to not be in Wall Street on the 16th of September, the day the bombings actually occurred. I'm sorry, but that is really sketchy. That's very odd. On that one day that this massive explosion happens, he's wanting friends and family not to be there. Yeah, he, must know be there. he must know something. So like the classic trope of a kid being like, hey, you were nice to me in school. Like, don't come to school tomorrow. What made him even more suspicious is when the police asked him how he came about this information, he said he came about it through the air. Oh yeah, that old chestnut yeah. through, the, through the air. He hasn't really thought that one through, has he? You know, you're coming to my birthday party tonight. Have you invited me? I thought you'd hear through the air. Doesn't really stick, does nah. it? Unfortunately, but still rather strangely, it was actually pure coincidence that he predicted the bombing. We are here for today's ad read and that is brought to you by the lovely people at Harry's. Now, Harry's is more than a super sharp razor company. They are here to revamp your whole routine from close shaves and flake free hair all the way to healthy skin. Harry's is here to help us guys feel great. Now, fortunately for us all here today, Harry's are offering you guys that listen to The Fellas Mysteries a free travel size shower gel with a trial set so you can test out other stuff besides shaving. In this trial set, there are a lot of goodies. An expertly engineered weighted handle, one five blade cartridge crafted in their own German factories complete with a precision trimmer, a handy foaming shaving gel for effective lubrication, a travel blade cover for life's adventures and a free shower gel, just like I said, for you guys. Now the Harry's Shaver, this is a serious product. It's a premium product. You ain't gonna have, you know, the little cuts, little niggles that you'll get on your face, little bit of bleeding, not today. Not with Harry's Shaver. Have you used the Harry's Shavers before? I have, yeah, it's great. And that shower gel smells unreal. Now a couple of interesting facts that I will throw at you that you're gonna wanna know. Harry's products are formulated with zero sulfates, parabens, or dyes, and are alcohol free. So no nasty business going on in there. Little tip for you here, cleansing and exfoliating before you shave increases the chance of cleaner results. Did you know that? Mm, I didn't know I that. I did not know that. And Harry's shower gels, face wash, and skincare products can be added to shave plans anytime, anywhere. Now make sure to get your hands on this free trial set, and of course you'll be supporting the podcast at the same time by giving your own shower shave a go. By redeeming a Harry's free trial set, and all you have to cover is the three pound 95 delivery fee. That is not bad. It's a steal. You, if you ask me, that's pretty good. Just head to harrys.com forward slash fellas to have your set delivered and start a shave plan, and your freebie will be added at checkout. That is harrys.com forward slash fellas. Check them out. Check them out. What are you waiting for? They ended up noticing that he had actually made loads of these types of predictions and warnings before, but all for events that just never materialized. He was actually shortly after diagnosed as being insane, but harmless and committed to Amateurville Asylum. I'm sorry, but I just still don't understand how he's managed to predict the se September 16th, you know, don't be there, tell all his friends and family. Is that pure coincidence? It is weird. It is weirdly accurate, isn't it? But I guess if he's doing so many of these, and it's sort of one of those where, you know, there could be loads of people warning of these type of events, like eventually... Yeah. A broken clock is twice right a day. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> the main lead was a letter carrier that had found four crudely spelled and printed flyers in the area from a group calling itself the American Anarchist Fighters that demanded the release of political prisoners. The warning was found a block away from the explosion, and since the mailbox was emptied around 11.30 each day, it's believed the bombers dropped the message into the mailbox on their way to exploding the bomb. The flyer read, Remember, we will not tolerate any longer. Free the political prisoners, or it will be death for all of you. Signed off by American Anarchist Fighters. Another suspect was a guy called Petro Angelo, now he'd been connected to another bomb plot in 1919, and they thought that he might have been involved again here. But unfortunately, he had an alibi, so the investigation didn't really get anywhere. But weirdly, he was still deported. 
Wow. Yeah, we don't think you're the guy, but yeah, yeah. you're gone anyway. Well, I mean, if he was connected to a 1919 bomb plot, now he's kind of connected to this one, or they suspect him. Yeah. Maybe it's just better to have this guy out of the country, right? Yeah, better safe than sorry type mm -hmm. thing. One thing detectives noticed about these flyers was that they were very similar to flyers that had been used the previous year mm -hmm. in two bombing campaigns by Italian anarchists. Okay. Now, the leader of the Gallianist group, Luigi Galliani, had actually been deported the year before, but a lot of aspects about the bomb matched some of the aspects of the bombs used in their previous plots, such as the, the use of iron as shrapnel. Galliani was a powerful public speaker who basically believed that violence was necessary to overthrow the capitalists that oppressed the working man. And obviously the Gallianists agreed with this message. They spread newsletters, speeches, plays, and occasionally they would even go as far as bombing certain locations just so they could get the message across. Interestingly, five days before the bomb on Wall Street exploded, Two Italian anarchists, who were believed but not confirmed to be Gallianists, called Sacco and Vanzetti, were indicted for killing a payroll guard and a clerk and making $16,000 in cash. This was obviously nothing political, but some claim that they must have been part of the bombing conspiracies and that their arrest was completed in order to point to their participation, essentially framing them for the attack. Now, there was some speculation at the time around a man named Mario Buda, who was rumored to have carried out the attacks in retaliation to the indictment of Sacco and Vanzetti. But unfortunately, he was never brought in for questioning and he fled as soon as the attacks happened. Suspicious. Quite suspicious. Don't be suspicious. Could be that he, he kind of thought, he was like, either he did it and he was running because he's like, damn, I'm going to get caught. Yeah. Or he was like, people will point fingers at me, so I want to get out before yeah. that happens. So, yeah, that's true. You know, you nothing know. stone cold, but suspicious. There's something there. The authorities pushed down on framing the anarchists for the bombing, but nothing actually ever materialized from it. Nobody ever actually got arrested for it. And this left America with a legacy of the Red Scare era. It's interesting because they're kind of almost using a terrorist attack against them as propaganda. I mean, not, not the first time the Americans have done that, but kind of going like, damn, we can kind of use this to further our anti-communist and pro-capitalist agenda themselves. The director of the FBI also thought that it could be Russia. Oh, well, there you so go. Just a final point to just, add there. Just adding to it. But that is the mystery. What do you think? I'm I still, really thinking, don't I'm still know. thinking about the tennis champion. Oh, he's, he's it's still, an odd one, isn't it? It's still in my mind. I just can't get how you would be able yeah. to correctly predict that. I think that's just a remarkable stroke of luck. I think it sounds like the Italian anarchists were behind this. Yeah, that is the most plausible theory. They're all acting very shady they're, after yeah, the event. Their two guys got arrested. Yeah. The the flyers that were posted around say free the political prisoners yeah. kind of adds up a little bit. And the, the fact that they looked exactly like the flyers that were used in bombings years before. Oh, yes. As well, like the, their leader getting deported like surely as a big retaliation thing, they're gonna be like, you know what, you strike at the heart of our group, we're gonna strike at the heart of your capitalist system to Damn. take down Wall Street. But they didn't, you know, they didn't achieve really what they wanted to, did they? Yeah. I mean, like we said, all the all the rich and powerful people were inside in, in meetings having lunch, mm -hmm. and it was actually the more middle class people mm -hmm. who actually suffered and, and paid the price, paid the ultimate price for their lives, so a tragedy on all fronts. Anyway, guys, please let us know your thoughts. Let us know who you thought carried out this attack and we will see you all on next Monday for another mystery. Thank you, Arthur. Thanks for, for watching. Today. Thanks for watching.